Hi there, and welcome to Telefunkian. Today's video is the second in our series on developing a MIDI kit for a vintage analog drum machine using Arduino. In this series, we're using the Roland CR8000 as our test case, where we design, program, install, and test a MIDI to trigger converter using Arduino as our development platform. While we're using the CR8000 as a prototypical vintage instrument that we would like to control with MIDI, many of the principles we're covering apply to other instruments and are especially relevant when we consider early electronic drum machines. If you've missed our previous video, be sure to check out part one in this series where we demonstrated proof of concept for our MIDI to trigger converter using Arduino and showed that we can use the Arduino and the Arduino MIDI library to read incoming MIDI data and output DIN sync and S trigger data in formats that can be used by our vintage drum machine. In today's installment, we'll design and build our next prototype on a breadboard using a dip package microprocessor and spend some time optimizing our code. Once we have our hardware down pat, we'll design a PCB, build it, and assemble the final project and our drum machine. If this sounds interesting, stay tuned and consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching. Our initial proof of concept could have been achieved using pretty much any Arduino. And in our case, we used an Arduino Uno. But when it comes to choosing the microcontroller we'll use in our final project, we have a number of selection criteria to consider. Foremost amongst these are the number of inputs and outputs we'll need. We know we need one input to receive MIDI data. And as we want to be able to select the MIDI channel, we will need at least four more inputs that we'll use to establish an array of binary switches to select from MIDI channel 1 through 16. We need 17 outputs for this project, one for each of 14 voice triggers, one for accent, and one for start-stop, and one for the clock data output to the drum machine. Many of the 8-bit microcontrollers we might consider have fewer than the 17 outputs we need in this application. This is a problem that can be readily overcome through the use of multiplexing. Multiplexing is a strategy that allows you to add more inputs or outputs to a small microprocessor, but it does require the use of additional multiplexing chips and slightly more complex coding. In this project, we're going to avoid that type of complexity, keep the code simple, and keep our chip count down. This means we'll need to choose a microcontroller with 17 or more outputs, and thankfully, there are plenty to choose from. Although some microcontrollers have built-in USB capability, which might be convenient for troubleshooting purposes, it isn't actually necessary in our final product. So we'll go with a chip that doesn't have this built-in USB capability. Also, though we don't know for sure until we start writing the code, we don't expect that our program will require a significant amount of RAM. We do know that if we're going to develop a prototype using a breadboard, then switch to surface-mounted devices for the final product, it would be helpful if our chosen microcontroller is available in both dual inline, aka DIP packaging, and SMD format. Another consideration for this project is the availability of the chip itself. At the time of this project, which began in late 2022, there's an ongoing global chip shortage, and some of the most popular microcontrollers, such as those used in Arduinos like the popular Atmega 328, are on back order until sometime later in the fall of 2023. So we want to make sure that we design this project using a chip that we can actually find in stock at a reputable vendor. Given all of the above, we've settled on the Atmega 324 for this project. The 324 has 32K of flash RAM, which should be more than enough for our program. More importantly, it has up to 32 general purpose I.O. lines, overcoming the need to rely on external multiplexing circuitry. The 324 doesn't have USB capabilities, but we'll program the chip using an in-circuit, in-system programming interface. The chip is available in both DIP and surface-mounted packages, facilitating development on a breadboard and porting to an SMD-mounted chip in the final version. Most importantly, the 324 chips are in stock at a fair price for most of our usual, reputable suppliers. Since we're building our prototype on a breadboard, rather than using the Arduino, we'll need to supply a few more components to support the operation of the microcontroller. The approach we're taking here is so common, it's even been given a name or two, and you'll find it described in various places online as bare bones Arduino, or even Bearduino. If we examine the Arduino Uno PCB, we'll find various components that can be thought of and grouped together according to their function. First, we have a number of components that power the Arduino, either from the USB bus or an external power supply. There are voltage regulators, capacitors, a comparator, and a barrel jack, 
all dedicated to selecting and conditioning the power source and powering the microcontroller. As we'll be providing conditioned power from an external source, we don't need these in our breadboard circuit. There are also several components that support the USB interface that we won't be needing. All of the sockets and pins on the Arduino PCB that provide access to the microcontroller I.O. will be made redundant by the breadboard itself. The remaining components that we need on our breadboard are those that give the microcontroller ability to keep track of time and generate serial communication signals, namely the crystal oscillator. We'll be using a 16 MHz crystal and two ceramic load capacitors of 22 picofarads each. We'll also need a 10K pull-up resistor that will be in between the microcontroller's reset pin and the positive voltage supply. Notwithstanding the use of an external power supply, we'll also add a 100 nanofarad film capacitor that we'll place across the positive and negative voltage rails to provide for some degree of local smoothing. While the Arduino PCB has a built-in LED that we were previously using as both a power indicator and to monitor incoming MIDI, we'll need to add an LED to our breadboard, along with a current limiting resistor, if we want to have a power indicator on our breadboard prototype. Along with the components we had previously used to build the breadboarded MIDI input circuit we used with Arduino Uno, that's really all we need to make our microcontroller run code that will read and interpret incoming MIDI data. We previously mentioned we want to build a circuit that will allow us to select which of the 16 available MIDI channels we want the drum machine to use. A simple way to do this is to use four switches that we can arrange to choose between MIDI channels 1 to 16. We connect one end of each switch to a GPIO pin and the other end to ground. The microcontroller will be programmed to read each switch on startup and interpret their collective settings as corresponding with the desired MIDI channel. A stylized version of our breadboard prototype is shown here. Some of the component placement is a little different than my actual build, but the circuit is the same. Feel free to stop the video and take a screenshot or make some notes. But before we test this circuit with our drum machine, let's discuss some of the changes we'll need to make to our code. First, let's discuss the MIDI channel selection. We need to declare a variable that will hold the integer value of our MIDI channel, and we'll set this to be equal to 1 for the time being. The switches we'll use to select the MIDI channel are DIP switches, and we'll connect four of these to four of the microcontroller's GPIO pins. These need to be defined in our code, as shown here, and in the setup portion of our code, we need to initialize these pins so the microcontroller knows they're going to be used as inputs, and we set them to be a logic high using the input pull-up statement. We then call the function DIP switch, which will read from our DIP switches, return the selected MIDI channel number, and initialize MIDI sending and receiving on the selected channel. Here we have the code for the dip switch function. Each switch corresponds to one of four bits in a four bit byte. Turning the switch on connects the pin to ground and pulls down the voltage on the pin that was previously set high. The function reads each pin in turn from the most significant bit to the least and adds the value of each selected bit with high being one and low being zero to the dip switch value and returns the sum as the selected MIDI channel number. Channels 1 to 15 are selected by the corresponding binary numbers, while channel 16 is selected by having all four switches in the off position, a setting which would otherwise be channel 0, which of course doesn't actually exist. Once our microcontroller has read the MIDI channel, it would be helpful if we could have it indicate that it has been properly initialized and is ready to receive MIDI data on the channel we've selected. Here, we've written a piece of code that will blink the run stop indicator LED attached to the start-stop pin a given number of times corresponding to the selected MIDI channel number. We'll run this code on system startup and thereby display the MIDI channel number to remind the user which channel the instrument is being used on and confirming the microcontroller is operating as it should. In our previous video, we had developed an Arduino prototype using code that relied on the delay function to generate timed pulses at the clock and drum trigger GPIO pins. We pointed out how unsatisfactory this approach was, given that these functions would bog down the processor while it was waiting for each pulse to finish, and we described an approach to overcoming this issue by timing each pulse duration using the millis function. Using millis, we read and record the time when we started any given timed pulse. We then move on and execute other code and periodically check back and see how much time has passed since our pulse began. Once we've exceeded a predetermined pulse duration, we then end the pulse. The key here is that once we've started the pulse, we free up the microcontroller to run other code 
including code that tells it to listen for more incoming MIDI data and play other drum notes. The way this is implemented is shown here, where we have added two additional functions to our main loop. We read the MIDI data, which will trigger any necessary clock or drum trigger pulses. Then we check to see if we need to turn off the clock pulse. Then we check to see if we need to turn off any drum trigger pulses and repeat. So now that we have all the elements we need for this stage of our prototype, let's compile our code, load it in the microcontroller, and see how it works. In our first prototype, we used an Arduino Uno that we programmed using the Arduino IDE. All we had to do to load our program was connect the Arduino to the computer USB port and press the upload icon in the ID to start the process that transferred our sketch into the Arduino's flash memory. Now we have an AppMega 324 on a breadboard. How do we get our software into the microcontroller chip? To do this, we need to take advantage of something called the In-Circuit Serial Programmer or ICSP, also referred to by some as the In-System Programmer, In-Circuit Programmer, or the In-Circuit System Programmer, or ISP. This facility allows the user to connect to the microcontroller and program the flash memory without using a USB interface. As we're working with a brand new microcontroller chip, we're going to make sure that the first time we program anything into the microcontroller, we take the opportunity to set a series of bits that tell the microcontroller how to function. And in our case, we want the microcontroller to function in the same way that it might if it were embedded in a full-blown Arduino. Before we do anything else, we'll do this by burning a small piece of code called a bootloader in the microcontroller's flash RAM. The bootloader is only 512 bytes, but amongst other things, it tells the microcontroller to look for code that could be available at the serial port and to load that code into flash RAM. If no code is available at the serial port, the microcontroller will simply execute the code that already resides in RAM. The bootloader is an integral part of the microcontroller's identity and is essential for full compatibility with the Arduino IDE, the software we're using to write our code. Thankfully, the folks at Arduino have once again done a lot of the hard work on our behalf. Every Arduino has the ability to function as an in-circuit serial programmer that can be used to upload software into a wide range of microcontrollers. The software required to accomplish this is embedded in the Arduino IDE and is accessed under the Tools menu by selecting Programmer Arduino as ISP. To get the software from our PC into the Arduino, we simply connect the Arduino to the PC using the USB interface. To get the software to pass from the IDE through the Arduino and into the microcontroller chip on our breadboard, we need to connect the six ICSP pins on the Arduino to the six ICSP pins on the microcontroller. Two of these pins, labeled plus five volts and ground, provide power to our breadboard and microcontroller. A third pin, SCK, is the serial clock, and it makes sure that the two microcontrollers are in sync. Two others, MOSI and MISO, or master output, slave input, and master input, slave output, are the data transmit and receive pins while the last connection, the reset pin, tells the target microcontroller when to load and when to execute the uploaded code. Note that these designations, specifically the use of the terms master and slave, are more broadly under review in this and other contexts. In the future, we can expect them to be replaced by terms such as source and target, director and performer, initiator and target, or parent and child, but for the moment, we're stuck with this language. Most Arduinos have these six ICSP pins arranged as a cluster of six pins on their PCBs, the so-called SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface, or they can be accessed using the appropriate pin headers on the Arduino. These same functions can be accessed in our breadboard prototype by attaching to the breadboard at the relevant points, but in this regard, some caution is warranted. Though there's some consistency in the arrangement of these six pins in a standard SPI interface, each microcontroller, and indeed, even different package versions of the same microcontrollers present these functions on different physical pins on their chips. The connections shown here are for the Arduino Uno as ISP and the DIP40 packaged AppMega 324. If you're using a different Arduino as ISP or a different microcontroller chip, you'll have to refer to the appropriate data sheets for the relevant pin numbers. One more thing. The chip we've selected for our project, the AppMega 324, is not currently used in any of the commercially available Arduino boards. And as a result, 
it is not among the chips supported in the current version of the Arduino IDE software. Not to worry, as we can use Mighty Core. Mighty Core is an Arduino core that runs on many of the larger Atmega chips, including some of those, such as the 324, that have not been officially implemented by Arduino themselves. Mighty Core is available at GitHub, where you can find instructions on how to install the Mighty Core package into your Arduino IDE. This is done by simply adding a URL to the list of additional board manager URLs in the IDE's File Preferences menu item, then using the Tools Boards Board Manager menu item to install the Mighty Core Board Manager. Mighty Core provides for an extension to the IDE Boards Manager that will allow you to select the Atmega 324 and a host of other new boards for programming using the Arduino IDE. This allows for programming using either USB or via the ICSP using another Arduino as programmer. So, with the Mighty Core Board Manager extension installed, the UNO connected to our breadboard, and our computer connected to the UNO via USB, let's burn our bootloader and load our program into our breadboard prototype. So we have our breadboard prototype here and we have our Arduino Uno. And we would like to connect the Arduino Uno to the breadboard prototype so that we can use it as an in-circuit system programmer to get our Arduino sketch into the microcontroller chip. You can see that the Arduino Uno is powered up. It's connected through USB, which is providing power. I'm going to disconnect that uh, while I am making the ISP connections between the Arduino Uno and the microcontroller. You can also see here that I have a, uh, a, a header, a two by three header, which I've made up, which has pins that uh, allow me to use an ISP header on an Arduino Uno or on a PCB that I construct and then interface with uh, either breadboard or the headers on, on the Arduino Uno itself. I'm going to take this out of the equation so as to simplify things a little bit. And we'll start from first principles here with uh, the connections between the Uno and the breadboard. So first things first, we'll connect the ground and we can simply use the ground connections on the, the header here on the Uno and we'll connect the black wire to the ground and we'll connect the red wire to our positive five volt power source on the Uno. And uh, there we go. And then we can connect these to the breadboard itself and our ground. We'll connect ground here and we'll connect positive five volts over here. Now it's important to recognize that uh, these are connected to pins 11 and 10 on the 324 respectively. 11 is the ground and 10 is the positive five volt supply VCC. So next we connect the reset pin, which is pin 10 on the Arduino Uno to pin nine on the 324. Pin nine is over here. Is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, it'll be right here where this green wire is that we can use to manually perform a reset on our breadboard prototype. The next uh, three pins are going to be in order, and this is pins eight, seven, and six 
on the 324, which correspond to the clock, master in, slave out, and master out, slave in, respectively. And so we'll connect these using these pins. Of course, immediately adjacent to the reset pin. There we go. And then we connect these to pins 11, 12, and 13 on the Arduino Uno. And this is in the reverse order. So the clock is pin 13. The um, master in slave out is pin 12 and the master out slave in is pin 11. So now we have the Arduino Uno connected to the breadboard prototype and all of the in-circuit system programmer connections have been made. We have our ground, our power, our reset, mosey, meso, and clock. And now we can power up the Arduino Uno and we can see that the Arduino Uno is passing power to our breadboard prototype. So we have the Arduino Uno connected to the breadboard prototype and we're ready to load a sketch into the breadboard. But in order to do that, we need to set up the Arduino Uno as an in-system programmer. So we connect it to our computer. The first thing we need to do is make sure that we have the correct board selected. So we go under board, Arduino AVR boards, and select an Arduino Uno. And so now the computer knows that it is communicating with the Arduino Uno. We then go under file, examples, and we have built-in examples, and here we have Arduino ISP, Arduino in-system programmer. And now we can see that the in-system programmer sketch has been loaded into the Arduino IDE. We want to ensure that this is compiling properly. So we're compiling it, and of course it compiles properly. And we now upload this into the Arduino Uno using the USB interface. So we're, we've done uploading, and so now the Arduino Uno is loaded with the Arduino ISP sketch. So now that we have the Arduino Uno connected to the breadboard prototype as an in-system programmer, we need to burn the bootloader into the 324. The way we do this is we go under Tools and we select the 324 under our Mighty Core as the board, the target board. We then go under Tools and uh, we select Programmer, Arduino as ISP, Arduino as in-system programmer. Then we select brownout detection at 4.3 volts because we're using a five volt supply. We want to burn a bootloader to UART zero. Our clock is an external 16 megahertz clock. We're going to not retain the EEPROM. We'll disable LTO and we'll use the standard pinout. Our variant for our chip is the 324A and once we've selected all of these things, we then simply select Burn Bootloader. And we're done burning the bootloader. That was achieved successfully. So now that we have uploaded our bootloader into the 324, 
what we do next is we open our sketch that we wish to load into the 324. And here it is. This is our MIDI to trigger converter. And what we do not do is we do not use this upload button to load the sketch. First thing we're going to do is we're going to verify the sketch. We're done compiling. Uh, we're connected to the 324 via the USB serial port using the uh, programmer, the Arduino as ISP programmer. And we now upload using the programmer. It's compiling the sketch, it's uploading. And it's done uploading. And what we see here now is we see the power on the breadboard prototype is lit. And if we disconnect the power and we reconnect, we're going to see a number of flashing lights, and those are indicating the selected MIDI channel. One, two. We've selected MIDI channel two. You may not be able to see it, but this second from the right switch has been selected. If I select another switch, this is the first from the right, the least significant bit, we've had previously MIDI channel 2 selected. I've added 1 to that. I'll repower to reset the program. 1, 2, 3. We're now indicating MIDI channel 3. And so that's how we use the in-circuit system programming functionality within the Arduino IDE and an Arduino Uno to load software into a bare bones Arduino on a breadboard. Well, what we have here is the next stage of the prototype of the MIDI DIN sync and MIDI to trigger converter. And it's now built on this breadboard. And we have now finished the programming so that the device is accepting MIDI in through the MIDI input and it is detecting a MIDI clock and it's sending out a clock signal to the CR8000. It is also detecting MIDI notes and it's responding to MIDI notes that are sent on a predetermined channel and that channel is selected using this dip switch arrangement here. We're only using four of the switches in this 10 switch array. We have LEDs that are indicating power, the MIDI clock start stop signal, the MIDI clock signal, and receipt of a drum trigger that is on the appropriate MIDI channel. The only parts that are utilized in this MIDI converter are those that are on this breadboard. The Arduino Uno is being used as an in-system programmer to load the software onto the chip, but the chip is doing all of the work. So although this is a prototype, ultimately we would build this onto a board and uh, really utilize only the parts that you see here. So how does this work? Well, if I start the sequencer, and this is sending MIDI to the converter, we see that we initiate the timing and we're playing a drum pattern on the CR8000 in time. So if we initiate the sequencer, what this is doing is sending a MIDI clock through MIDI to uh, this converter. You can see that the green light comes on. That's the run indicator. And you can see that the clock, the blue light is flashing. And if we turn down the tempo, you may be able to see that actually flashing and being picked up by the camera because it's now flashing slow enough for you to see it. That's 24 pulses per quarter. 
and we're at 30 BPM. So that's uh, one beat every two seconds. And so um, we are looking at about 12 flashes per second. And again, it responds to the tempo. And if we send a, a MIDI note, and that is the clap, that's a MIDI note which is mapped to the, the drums. Um, we're triggering that, we see this activating. And we now have connected three different triggers. So that's the snare sound. The instrument needs to be calibrated. And I believe that's a snare, yeah. And, and that's a cymbal. So we see that we have control over individual drum sounds. We have the ability to send and receive MIDI clock. And th this appears to be working as it should. So what remains now is to convert this design into something that we can put on a printed circuit board and install in the drum machine, something that will have 15 independent triggers, uh, one for each of the drum sounds and one for the accent. So we've come quite a long way from the Arduino prototype we featured in our first episode in the series. By the end of that video, we had identified a number of improvements we wanted to make to our code to make it more efficient by using the millis function instead of delay and to allow for the selection and display of one of 16 MIDI channels. This version of the prototype has incorporated these improvements. We've also tested the ability to read individual MIDI drum notes and send out individual triggers to control one of three sounds in the CR8000. However, the CR8000 has 15 triggers that we'll want to emulate and we'll need an efficient way of organizing the data that relates to each. To do this, we'll modify the code to create array containers that will store the MIDI drum note, GPIO pin, trigger status, and the elapsed time of each drum trigger. The next iteration of our MIDI to trigger project will use all 15 drum triggers, and this seems like a good time to port the project over to a printed circuit board that we'll use to interface with the drum machine. We'll cover all of this in our next video, the third in our series on designing and building a MIDI kit for your vintage drum machine using Arduino. If this sounds interesting, stay tuned and consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching.